a discussion on the transition to digital television in the United States with Richard Wiley, the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. During his tenure at the Federal Communications Commission, Dick Wiley also served on a board at the time that was called the Advisory Committee on Advanced Television Service. That's Is right. there a simple way of uh, describing what that uh, board was about? Basically, the FCC asked me to head this committee to develop a new television standard for the United States. The existing standard was set back in 1941, if you uh, can believe it, and it was colorized in the 50s. And the FCC became aware that Japan and Western Europe were trying to develop what was called advanced television, or high definition television. And to jumpstart our national effort on that, uh, they set up the advisory committee. And so, as far as your role in concern, as part of it, why did you see the importance to study this thing, especially for the United States? I think Congress and the FCC both felt that this was going to be a worldwide uh, development, which it proved to be, and they wanted to make sure the United States viewers got the best of television. And we were behind at that point. Fortunately, uh, we went from last to first place during the, the epic uh, journey of the advisory committee. When you say behind, is, what do you mean? Well, we had not been working on advanced television. It had been worked on for maybe 10 years by Western Europe and Japan, but they were working on a conventional system, an analog television. That's our current standard. And what happened during the course of the advisory committee is that digital transmission became possible, basically the language of computers, and it proved to be a much finer system. Our advisory committee embraced it, whereas... I think the Japanese who had spent so much time on advanced analog television were slow to go there. And under objective testing, the digital transmission was actually much better. We are on the verge of a transition here as far as digital television That's is right. concerned. Most people who call into our various programs and may ask the question, why is this important for viewers in the U.S. to have this kind of switchover? I think it's because you're going to have a much better picture, much better sound, and the possibility of more services. And I think ultimately, uh, the interrelationship, interconnection of the computer and the television set. Dick Wiley is our guest on the Communicators this week. Also joining us to help in the questioning is Todd Shields with Bloomberg News, covers telecommunications issues. Mr. Shields. Hi, Mr. Wiley. Good, good to see you. Uh, good to see you as always. Uh, so we switch at midnight on February 17th. That's right. Um, what, what happens on February 18th? Well, if you've got a digital set or if you're a cable or satellite or, let's say, telephone video subscriber, you don't have to be concerned. But if you're one of the 19 million homes that have broadcast only service, then you've got to get a converter box, a box that will convert the new digital signals, which is all there will be on February 18th, back to analog so your existing equipment will still work. Or if you've got a second or third set at home that's not tied into the, your cable system, uh, that's an analog set, you want to get one of those converter boxes. Fortunately, the government has provided funding for that, uh, $40. Uh, you can get two coupons that will give you a $40 break toward the cost of those converter boxes, which cost about $60. Mm -hmm. Do people still have time to get those coupons from people, the Commerce Department? People still do have time, but the uh, time is getting short because it takes about four weeks to get that. And, and the, Congress, uh, has, the uh, Commerce Department is beginning to run out of money on this system. So I would advise anybody who has a analog set and wants to have a converter box, order it now. Why would you know, as far as the effectiveness of this transition, uh, some people, some in Congress, people like Ed Markey in Congress say there's, they're very concerned about what happens, yes. even some of the commission themselves. Some say it's going to be a really, relatively smooth transmission. Where do you fall in that ex those extremes? We really don't know. I think the big concern will be I mean, there's great public awareness now that this transition is occurring. Uh, statistics show us maybe 95% uh, of the population really knows that something's going to happen on February 18th. But I think in the uh, homes that are uh, broadcast only, that are perhaps lower income, maybe not English speaking, there could be a problem, I think, on February 18th. And that's why Congress recently passed, I think, a very wise piece of legislation that said even after February 18th, the sets can still have an analog signal that will give you some information, the so-called night light, and it will give the people information of where to go, how to get help on this. And the broadcast industry, cable industry, have set up uh, call centers to try to give the public more information on this. We want to get the word out. And 
Go ahead. Yeah, so will those call centers be able to, to handle the volume? The F FCC yesterday said their call center can handle about 200,000 calls. The broadcasters expect as many as a million the yeah. day after. Well, I think it's going to be a call center nationally. There'll be call centers locally. As you know, there also have been a lot of soft cutoffs. That is, you may have seen it on your television screen where you say, watch now at 528 this afternoon. Mm -hmm. If your set goes you know, blank, you know you've got an analog set and you've got to get a converter box. If it's working, if it's a digital set, it will work just fine. A lot of people aren't sure whether they've got an analog or a digital set. As far as uh, those tests, concerns about coupons, the availability of coupons, um, how would you grade how the government's rolled out this program? Initially, because you saw it from the beginning, maybe not in the specifics, but initially you saw maybe how this thing should, or at least maybe in your mind, saw how this thing should play out. How would you grade that against your ambitions? I think it's graded well, uh, and I think the industry's done a good job. Having said that, I, this is such a massive program, and we've got such a large country, there will be some people left behind. I think that's the, the bad news uh, that we're going to see on February 18th. The big question will be, we've got to get service to them as quickly as possible. We've got to get help to them and identify them. So that maybe the call center is, uh, is overloaded. Maybe the next day they're going to get service. Uh, get it as soon as possible. That's the point. Hmm. And, and the Obama administration's coming in. This will happen about a month after they're in office. It's a tough, tough situation. Yeah. Congress picked, I think, not exactly the optimum date to have it February 17th, the middle of winter, yeah. with a new administration coming in, but that was the decision that was made. And uh, we'll just have to see how it works out. Hmm. So it, the date should have been moved? I don't think the date will be moved. But should have been. Well, it could have been, let's say, phased in over a period of time, part of the country. But I think Congress decided it'd be better to, to bite the bullet here and get this done. You know, what's ahead, the good news is, what's ahead is a much improved video service for all of our viewers. And uh, they're going to see it. If they get a digital set, they'll see it right away. And I think nearly 50% of, of our homes now have digital high-definition sets. Mm -hmm. And when you see high-definition in your living room, uh, it is a tremendous picture. It's six times more picture content than existing sets. Uh, it's just a, a marvel. And that's something I always believed when we started this program in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, that it would be a greatly improved benefit for our public. Can, can people get that uh, high-def picture over the air using rabbit ears or a rooftop antenna? They can. In, so, in some respects, it's it's the best picture you can get because it's not compressed in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, the bits aren't squeezed a little bit. It's just coming straight over the air, and it's it's a very good signal. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have both over the air high definition, and I have high definition through uh, one of the subscription services, so I can kind of see it and compare. You know, as I'm I'm sort of a junkie in this area, as you know, Todd. So, so which is better from your comparison? Well, I mean, uh, they're both very good. I'll uh, say I'll be I'll be a diplomat. discreet. That's right. <laughs> uh, as far as the need, I could see maybe people in urban areas seeing the benefits of, of digital television. But how do you explain those to new rural areas who, who, who had over the air, that's all they know? Yes, I think for a while, uh, uh, people who have been, the FCC has gone out to visit some of the people in rural areas and said, why do we have to make this change? You know, uh, but I think ultimately they will see the benefits involved when they see the picture in their screen in their own home. Uh, the best news is if you can afford it, get a digital set. And, and the good news is the digital sets are world class today. Uh, the first digital sets in, uh, that were introduced in 1998 weren't perhaps optimum, but after a, a period of time and generations, it's really become great. And the price has fallen dramatically since 1998. So basically, a digital set sort of in the same range as the conventional sets were at one point. They're not sold today, as you know. The government decreed that all sales of analog sets would be cut off. What, what can people do who live far from a transmission tower and probably get a picture today with analog, might be a little grainy or wavy, and when they're using their over-the-air equipment, their digital picture might freeze up on them or drop out altogether. So instead of having marginal service, now they get no service. Is that, is that a widespread problem? Well, it's about 11 percent of the, of the uh, number of stations uh, would get the viewers might see some dislocations. Mm -hmm. I mean, the good news is for the vast number of our viewers, it's going to be a much better picture, much better service, uh, but and more service. But for a few, there could be a problem. And there, uh, the FCC has given the opportunity for broadcast stations to have so-called translators or boosters 
that would boost the signal so you could get help to people. Also, better antennas will help the problem, and that's where the call centers and the industry is trying to educate the public in that regard. As far as the end result, once we have the analog spectrum, I know there's been a lot of discussion about what to do with it once it's available. What's its best use? Well, the, the government has set up an auction program and has auctioned off, uh, and it's been a very successful auction from the standpoint of money being raised for the government, uh, to use that spectrum uh, for other business and wireless services. Uh, and uh, I think that you've seen companies like AT&T and Verizon and, and other companies come in and are going to use a very valuable spectrum for, to provide new third and fourth generation wireless services to the public. As far as uh, Chairman Martin is concerned, I know one of the things that he wanted to see during his tenure and possibly was working on was uh, free broadband as far as wireless broadband. Does that fall within this part of the spectrum? It could have been. It could have been. Uh, I think the, the uh, government hasn't made the decision where that's going to be done. I think one of the big failings uh, and it wasn't anybody's fault, but one of the big failings was that we didn't get uh, service for emergencies, uh, something like Katrina. And I think eventually there's a block of that spectrum that has not yet been re-auctioned uh, so they could use it for, for if we had a national terrorism, uh, God forbid on that, or uh, another Katrina, what have you. You could have the police and fire equipment working much better closer together and you could get the services in again to the public. Now there was money already slated for that kind yes. of service. Well, th there's spectrum available for it, but it, has, it was auctioned and the money really didn't come up to the level that the FCC wanted, so they're planning to re-auction it and I think that'll be done early in the new administration. And, and they'll be able to come up with a formula that requires whoever buys the spectrum to provide the national service for I think emergency that's, workers? I think that's what the government contemplates. I think that would be one of the requirements uh, that you've got to use it for maybe have a public-private uh, service for interoperable equipment uh, that could get service in there as quickly as possible. We need that and I think uh, the FCC under Chairman Martin and the new FCC will recognize that. Hmm. Do, you, do you have any uh, inkling on who will be our next FCC chairman after uh, Kevin Martin? Uh, no, I, you hear a lot of names but, you know, what usually happens is it's a name you don't hear becomes the, the new chairman. Out of the names you heard, anybody on that list that interests you? I think, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of names that are people who served in the Clinton administration that had experience at the FCC. I think all of them would be excellent. Uh, but you ne never know whether the president will make that decision. What do you think the president-elect, as far as philosophy is concerned, will bring to the FCC? What do you think as far as changes, as far as approach of the FCC might change under his administration? I think there'll probably be more emphasis on broadband, as we talked about before. I think this administration's been interested in it. I think the new administration wants to get it out across the country, as you suggested by your question, and particularly into rural areas. We might see more government uh, proactivity in that regard. Uh, I think there may be even new technology chief appointed by the president for the White House that will push new technology, and I think that's all to the good. So we turn it around and saying, what does it mean as far as gov when you say government in interaction, what does it mean for firms, telecommunication firms, wireless firms? How do they look at it? Because you represent them as a lawyer and you, and you deal with them. What do you think they're looking at as far as this administration is concerned? Well, I think they, they think this will be a proactive administration. I think there is, if they want to put the downside to it, is that will there be too much government action, will there be too much regulation, shall we say, and that's always the trade-off, and we'll just have to see on that. As far as broadband goes, plans to expand broadband, what mechanisms would the government have to do that? Would it be tax credits to cable and wireless companies, outright grants of some type? What, what would we likely see? What, what, what are the main avenues people well, are that, all those are possible. There's been some thought given to using the universal service fund that we all pay into on our telephone bills to try to expand that to use it for broadband service, to get broadband into the rural areas. And that's, I think, the big concern. Uh, broadband is available to a lot of Americans who choose not to, to, to take it for one reason or another. It's not available in some far reaches, and it's very expensive to get it into those areas. So it may be that some government help is needed in that regard. So if it comes from the Universal Service Fund, uh, there have been a lot of attempts to reform that fund over the years. It's a big uh, eight, nine billion a year, I yes. believe, a big fund, very complicated rules, and it's defied solution uh, so far. Is there 
Is there hope that a new administration can untie that Gordian knot? Well, I think this administration under Chairman Martin had made a really uh, Herculean effort to try to get it done here toward the, the dying days, uh, and they, didn't, they weren't able to get there. The, the five commissioners couldn't come together on a single program, as I understand it. So we'll see. I, I expect, though, uh, that that will be one of the first things on the new FCC chairman's agenda. Is there an ideal way to work the Universal Service Fund in your mind? Well, I, I think the, the concept would be, no, there's no ideal way because we haven't gotten there, certainly. I think the concern is the fund has grown so large, as Todd suggested, that it may be too many demands upon it. Uh, and I think that the commission has even thought about, you know, has capped it to a certain level because we can't let it get too big. I think uh, there may be a change that Chairman Martin has talked about as far as who contributes to the Universal Service Fund, uh, getting interstate uh, revenues into it, which would help the fund get more money. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different ways to get it done. Uh, we need the best thinking possible in that regard. And we'll still need this type of fund? Could it be a case where they eliminate the fund and kind of try to direct those revenues in other ways? We've had this fund since 1934. Uh, when the, the uh, act was first, uh, uh, the FCC was first set up. And the idea is to try to, there are high cost areas, uh, basic out in rural areas or in urban areas. We want to make sure uh, that you get services to those people because you might have a child choking and you have to get a doctor there. Uh, and that was the original thought, to make sure that telephone service was affordable in rural areas and in, 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 in urban areas. Now, the thought is maybe let's move it to a new technology type concept and try to get services there. And I think that's what the thinking is. Do changes on Capitol Hill affect the likelihood of reform of USF or, or of having you know, more broadband? We have Senator Jay Rockefeller, Democrat, West Virginia, mm -hmm. taking over the Senate Commerce Committee, which was formerly headed by um, the senator from Alaska, Ted Stevens, the Republican. Does, is, does that change make a difference? And also on the House side. I think there's a great deal of interest of Senator Rockefeller in broadband development. And I think, uh, generally speaking, I think both Republicans and Democrats want this. The question is how to do it and how much should be done uh, by the government and how much should be done in the private sector. And I think that's where we're going to see some debate. You're talking about changes, Senator Rockefeller being one Senator Wax or Representative Waxman taking over the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Philosophically, I guess, as far as those two appointments, do you see changes in policy or at least approach when it comes to telecom issues? Well, I think it's, you know Congressman Waxman uh, has been more involved in health care issues and has not really been uh, as, as directly involved in uh, communications of recent, although he was back in the days when I served, when he first got, came to Congress. Uh, I'm sure he'll get up to speed very quickly. He's got a good staff in that regard. I know some of the, the folks, and I think you're going to see an active, aggressive uh, congressional uh, interest in communications on both uh, the Senate and the House. One good thing about the FCC is you do have a bipartisanship there. I know bipartisanship is something that people think doesn't work in Washington, but I think over the years there's been a general agreement between both uh, liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats, on advancing new technology. Maybe differences along, you know, some of the margins, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, we've we've developed in this country digital high definition television. We develop broadband, uh, and that's been done uh, under both administrations. It's had its critics, though. Uh, oh, the, definitely. The House Ener Energy or the Subcommittee on Investigations just put out a report looking at uh, Chairman Martin's tenure at the FCC. Uh, especially in terms of how it did its business. You saw that report, I'm sure. Yes. You're, you're, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I, I think there were no violations of law, and that's, I think that should be pointed out in Chairman Martin's uh, uh, defense. I think it, a lot of it had to do with how you run the commission, how you operate the commission, and I think uh, Chairman Martin's defenders would say there haven't been great changes uh, you know, from administration to administration. But uh, I think some people felt that there, there were style, uh, management style uh, changes that ought to be made. And just to be clear, did he used to work for you? He was an associate for two years at our firm. And so yeah. back to the, the report, was the report fair? I think it was fair. I think it was fair, but you know, you could say there are other uh, aspects to it that, that, that could have been brought in to, to defend Chairman Martin. So, Such as? Well, the fact that he got a lot accomplished during his period of time. But I think some people disagree with the way he ran the commission. Does he have, uh, he's got uh, about a month left, one would presume. The yes. Obama administration takes power January 20th, and we'd expect to see at least an interim chairman 
uh, take over from yes. Chairman Martin. Probably Chairman Cobb, uh, Commissioner Cobbs, because I th at least the word is that they're likely to pick the senior mm -hmm. commissioner in each agency. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that'd be an easy way to do it, to serve as an interim. But my guess is that this administration will pick a new FCC chairman rather quickly. Sometimes it's taken a long time. In the Clinton administration, it took a year for Chairman Hunt to get in office. I'd be surprised if this administration would be that slow. So the interim chairman, perhaps Chairman Copps, would, would serve uh, until the successor chairman can get, make it through the Senate, get confirmed by the Senate, would yeah. be the idea there. You're right. So in any event, Chairman Martin's tenure presumably ends January 20th. He could serve on, but... Uh, as a commissioner, as a not commissioner, as a chairman. But my guess is, and generally speaking, um, uh, most commissioners have left, most chairmen have left. I, I happen to have served for 11 months in a Democratic administration. I'm a Republican. Because uh, they asked me to stay on, I liked the job, so I stayed on. I don't think that's the style today, though. Doesn't seem to be. So, what can Chairman Martin do in the remaining three weeks? Does he have any power left? I, he has, certainly does. There's some pending issues, but what Congress told him, again, Senator Rockefeller and Congressman Waxman told him, concentrate on the digital television transition, do the emergency matters in other areas, but don't take other policy issues on. That was their request, and I think Chairman uh, Martin is generally following that. I think he's focusing on the digital television transition. So I don't expect to see any big initiatives. And we also have a situation where one member of the FCC, uh, Deborah Tate, uh, her term expired, is to leave the, uh, the commission when the 110th Congress uh, Yeah, probably adjourns. next Tuesday, something like that. I yeah, or, or perhaps as early as uh, today, Saturday, when this is being broadcast. I'm not sure what the adjournment date okay, is. Okay, well, January 2nd, 3rd, something like that. In any event, uh, they'll leave the commission with two Democrats, two Republicans, right. for the remainder of chair, until, until new, new people can be sent through the Senate. Well, and if Chairman Martin resigns on January 20th, which a lot of people think may happen, uh, then we'll have three commissioners. That's not unusual. It's happened in the past. You'd have two Democrats and one Republican then. And that, the commission will still operate uh, <clears throat> because it will take some months to get that new chairman in. I think the FBI checks, uh, I've heard, take three to four mm -hmm. months. So no matter who's named, uh, unless it's an existing government official, uh, it's going to take some time. There's a professor at um, Stanford Law School, Lawrence Lessig, who writes a lot about telecommunications. Gone to Harvard now, as I understand. Uh, and so he writes about, he wrote a piece for Newsweek on its online version about the FCC specifically. A bit of what he said is this. He said, with so much in its reach, the FCC has become the target of enormous campaigns for influence. Its commissioners are meant to be, quote, expert and, quote, independent. But they've never really been expert and now only openly embracing the political role they play. Commissioners issues press, issue press releases touting their own personal policies, and lobbyists spend years getting close to members of this junior varsity Congress. <laughs> what do you think about that? Solution? Kind of harsh, I think. Kind of harsh. I think it's an expert agency. I think through the years it's done a good job in uh, trying to bring new services. And I don't say this is under both Republican and Democratic uh, leadership. I'll, I'll exempt my own area, uh, my own tenure there. But I think, generally speaking, the commission has been a good, good agency. You could disagree with their decisions, but I think uh, you don't find much scandal over there. Uh, the Chairman Martin report was not a scandal situation. It was really a, a question, of, again, of his leadership style. You can agree or disagree on that. And uh, uh, I, I think the Commission, is, through the years, has, has stood this test of time. Is it become more political over the years as you've seen it? I, it's inevitable it's going to be. because And Congress really set it up not to be a judicial body a body that lived with the industry, that knows the industry, that is an expert in that, and is responsive to Congress. So if it's responsive to Congress, it's going to be political to an extent. And some of the commissioners have come from Capitol Hill. Uh, they have a political background. So that's, that's inevitable. I don't think that's necessarily a curse, by the way. Um, a, a, an issue that animated the FCC uh, some years ago and has been frozen because we're awaiting court decisions is uh, televised or broadcast indecency. Mm -hmm. What do we expect from the new Democratic-dominated FCC? Well, I think everybody's going to maybe take a pause and wait for the Supreme Court to rule. We haven't had a ruling uh, on the Supreme Court since 1978, really ruling on some decisions that my commission made in, the 70, in 1975 upholding the FCC's authority in this area. Uh, and I think now the question is, has the FCC gone a little far in some areas? <clears throat> and is there still authority for indecency uh, regulation? And my guess is the, the, the court will say the commission still has authority in this area, but then they'll tell us whether the commission's most recent rulings uh, have been appropriate.
Could you review for us a bit the case before the Supreme Court now concerns what exactly? Well, you know, there's been a question of whether or not a, uh, an utterance, let's say, that comes out uh, very quickly, spontaneously, uh, should be as regulated as the, the government has. So-called fleeting expletives. Fleeting expletives is the right. word. You know, let's say somebody says an F word during a football game that's picked up over the air. Should the stations be punished for that? Chairman Martin has been very strong in this regard, protecting the, the public as he sees it. Uh, some feel that he's gone too far. The, the industry certainly has, uh, and I represent the industry, as you suggest, uh, and uh, uh, has taken this up. And remember, there was also the Supreme Court case uh, that, uh, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the uh, Super Bowl case, mm -hmm. the Janet Jackson mm -hmm. uh, wardrobe malfunction case. That's also going to be wrapped into this overall decision by the Supreme Court. But uh, it, it's good because it's been over 30 years now that we haven't seen the, uh, uh, it, this, the court speak on this. So it's time, perhaps. One of the complications is how to define obscenity and that at least that's always been the, the argument I've heard. It's really uh, indecency by the way. Obscenity is hardcore pornography which is banned 24 hours a day and, and I don't think there's any dispute on that. The question is indecency which is basically language that depicts sexual acts or organs and and yes it's very difficult to define that. I think the uh, basically the courts have defined it. The question is as the FCC begins to move into individual cases, have they done that appropriately? You but I do think there, that there is a place for it because we do have to protect younger children. That's what my commission said is, we want it because of the immediacy of broadcasting into the American home and because of the presence of children. And therefore, the courts came along and said, in the late evening hours or the early morning hours, when children weren't likely to be in the audience, you could have some more adult programming. Safe and that's harbor the way, laws, I safe guess. Safe harbor yeah. law, exactly. And that's the way it's worked out over the years. I think the fleeting expletive is really the question as to whether or not the, the uh, commission has gone too far. On and that. we should point out these, these indecency laws apply to broadcast, not to cable television. That's right. Where you're, after all, if you want to go to see a uh, R-rated movie, you paid your money, uh, the government shouldn't interfere with that decision in all likelihood unless it's obscene. And the same thing is if you paid for cable or satellite service, a paid service in your home, you made that judgment uh, that's appropriate for your household. Now, there is a concern that your children may actually catch the same programming uh, over the air uh, uh, as they did see on cable, and that's a problem, I think. But I don't think the, the, uh, the law is set up to, to deal with that. Do you think the commission, in, in terms of indecency, went too far? Uh, I think that there's a, a question as to whether fleeting expletives is a very difficult thing for the uh, industry to deal with. Uh, and I, I, do we want to have a five or seven second delay on all over the air sports, shall we say, all live sports? I question that, frankly. But we'll see. Let, let's let the Supreme Court decide it rather than Dick Wiley. We have time for one more question. Uh, I've got a cleanup question on digital television, which okay. has to do with the stations can send multiple streams of programming as one benefit viewers get. Yes. It's not only the main broadcast stream, but there are second and third that most stations send. In I've other noticed. Words, you can take a $20 million a bit, bit stream right. and break it up into one high definition picture or perhaps three or four or five you know, picture streams of basically the same quality that we have today. So what will viewers see on those extra on those extra channels that they get? You might see uh, a 24-hour weather service. Uh, you're seeing that to some extent now. You might see more local news, more local sports. And I think it'd be good. And you might see more educational programming on public television during the daytime. That's something that the public uh, folks talked to me about when I was running the advisory committee. I was very supportive of it. I think it gives broadcasters an opportunity to enter the multiple programming area to compete better with cable and satellite. And I think that's good. Dick Thank Wiley you. is the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, our guest also on this edition of The Communicators. Todd Shields of Bloomberg News. To both of you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pedro. Thanks.